book of Proverbs, chapter number 23. I want to begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye. Neither desire thou his dainty meats. For he, or for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We certainly thank you for the good singing, the good testimonies. Oh Lord, it's a blessing to see young people get up and sing the old songs and know the meaning behind them. God, we're certainly... Uh, without excuse not to be thankful for your blessings on us. And God, we're thankful that no matter what trial, no matter what fiery trial that we go through, we never go through it alone, that you're always walking with us. And God, we bless you and praise you for being a great God. Now, Father, as we come to you tonight, we do pray for those of our church family that are sick. We pray for Miss Sonny. We pray for... Miss Crystal, we pray for Miss Renee, we pray for Brother Jordan, we pray, Father, for uh, others that are sick, that, Lord, you touch them and help them. We pray for Brother Gary's mother, we pray for Brother Eddie, we pray that, Lord, you would just undergird them and help them tonight, and sustain them and help them to be back with us as soon as possible. We pray for Brother Clint tonight who couldn't be here. We do pray, Father, for our upcoming events that you'd be glorified and that lives would be changed. But now we pray for this part of the service, that God, you'd rest our hearts and our minds, help us to bring our minds under subjection to pay attention to what thus saith the Lord. Father, uh, I do pray that, Lord, you would certainly put a hedge about us, that, God, you would open our minds and our hearts to things we have not seen or considered. And, Father, help us, Lord, to ever draw nigh to God. God, help us to impact the lives of others. Help us, Lord, to have compassion and make a difference. Now, Father, I pray if there be any amongst us tonight who are really struggling, that they would gain some insight and some help. I pray if there's anybody here tonight, Lord, that is cold and indifferent on God, that, God, they'd get things made right with thee. And I certainly pray, as Zachary prayed, if there's any amongst us unsaved, that, Lord, when they leave, that would not be the case that they'd repent and trust Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, Lord, use this unworthy vessel. Bring to my remembrance those things that you have showed me in these days. And, God, I pray again that you would illuminate the minds of your people, that you would edify them and encourage them in the faith. And I pray that um, ultimately you'd get glory from our lives. Father, we bless you again. And God, we thank you for your greatness, for it's in the wonderful and glorious name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Here we find in these verses instruction and application from Solomon in certain areas. The first thing I want you to notice is that he instructs on our demeanor. If you look again in verse number 1, he says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler... Consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Now can I say the Lord is not a masochist? The Lord is not advocating that we slit our throats. The Lord is teaching through Solomon what our demeanor ought to be if we are sitting in company with somebody that is a ruler, or somebody that is a dignitary, somebody that is uh, uh, esteemed highly. It might be the, the boss of your company. Uh, it might be uh, somebody that is uh, high and falutin in society. Uh, he is teaching us how to conduct ourselves. Uh, 
what he is trying to teach us in our demeanor uh, is that we ought to be who we are and try not to be who we are not. It is very important to understand that you shouldn't try to impress somebody who has a whole lot more than you. It's important to understand that you shouldn't try to be on an even playing field if you're not on an even playing field. If they are well off, bless the Lord, they're well off, don't act like you are. You need to be who you are. And he is teaching that you are to represent yourself with class and not to be a clown. And can I say that people who are in the position of who this, uh, we are being instructed that you sit down with, people in the, that position already know what, the, what their class is. And if you try to act like something you're not, you'll show yourself to have no class. I told you the other night, humility is known all your strengths and all your weaknesses and abide therein. And Solomon is teaching, do not strive for what that man has. Do not uh, uh, get so impressed for what, whatever they serve you uh, uh, to eat. And don't get caught up in that environment to where that propels you to desire to be that instead of who you are. That's why he said, put a knife to your throat. In other words, put a watch guard about yourself that you do not become what you are not. We see what our demeanor ought to be. God made you you. So just be you. Don't strive to impress somebody. Just be you. We see that he deals with demeanor. He also deals with desires. Look in verse number 4. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. Uh, they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. He deals with our desires. Your desire ought to be to please God, glorify God, and to see everybody around you get saved. That ought to be your desire. Your desire ought not to be rich. It's okay to have things. It's all right to be blessed with a good job, to live in a nice house, uh, to drive a nice automobile. But uh, uh, the Bible says in the New Testament, like it says it like this, uh, 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 godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, uh, it says be content with things such as you have. Uh, uh, don't uh, uh, long and lust for things that will draw you away from the will of God. because it's all vanity you can strive to be rich it's kind of like the old proverb a man sold his soul to get rich and as soon as he gained it all he died whose riches are they then hmm? you'd be a lot better off enjoying the family God's blessed you with enjoying the church God's blessed you with enjoy the things of God that he's blessed you with than to sell yourself out to become something you're really not. Everybody thinks if you hit it big, you have no problems. Well, once you hit it big, you've got to find tax shelters so you can keep it. You've got to hire security and security systems so somebody don't steal it. And you've got to let your, your, your relatives not know that you got it because they want to move in. Huh? Got to just be thankful for what God's blessed you with. Hmm? He deals with demeanor. He deals with desires. But then he deals with deceitfulness. Look at verse number 6. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. He is instructing us on deceitfulness. Whether or not you know it, the devil plants people in our lives to take us away from the will of God. Not everybody that says they are for you are for you. Can I say there are some who will attempt to draw you in? All you got to do is turn to Judges and read about Samson and Delilah. Delilah really wasn't for Samson. 
But she drew him in and got him to tell her the secrets of his heart when nobody else was able to do that throughout his life. They will draw you in. They will befriend you. They will talk sweet to you. They will make you think that you are the apple of their eye. They will draw you in. Can I say this? They will attempt to delight you or impress you or make you feel special in their eyes. They will make you think that you are, are so wonderful so you will eat of their dainty meats, whatever carrot they dangle before you. And let me just say this right now. You can adjust your halo afterwards. I don't care who you are. Everybody has a price. You may think, boy, I, <clears throat> I've been walking with God. I've got the Bible memorized. I got the Baptist creed down. I go to church every time the doors are open. I tithe. I go out knocking on doors. I do this. I do this. You already got an eye problem. There's been bigger and better and more spiritual people than anybody in this sanctuary tonight that had a price. The man who penned down the words that we're re right, reading tonight was the wisest man that ever lived and God blessed him with more than he could have ever spent and in the end he offered up sacrifice to false gods. And there have been people of every generation that thought they could handle it. And everybody has a price. The best thing you can do is stay close to Jesus. And they will draw you in. They will delight you for the sole purpose to defile you. The devil's got a bullseye on every one of our backs. And he'll do whatever he can, whenever he can, to put somebody in your path to lead you down the wrong path. I'm interested in verse number 7. The first part of this verse says this, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. I want you to underscore that several times in your Bible. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And friend, as you think in your heart, so are you. Hmm? Brother Donald, it don't mean, mean that the facts line up with what you think. But whatever you think, that's what you are. I want to preach with God's help for just a little while tonight on this thought. I want to preach on the power of the mind. The power of the mind. One philosopher said this, A man is but the product of his thoughts. What he thinks, he becomes. The mind is very powerful, friend. They estimate that in the span of your lifetime, you, you, you will use 10% of your brain function. They estimate that people like Albert Einstein and people that are mega geniuses that have helped shape the philosophies uh, of the world and the science of the world, uh, they estimate that those people use 15 to 17% of their mind capacity. Your mind is very powerful. If you can learn to train your mind to use 11%, 12%, you will stand up out far above your peers. The mind is very powerful. The mind shapes us, molds us. It trains our beliefs. It will propel us or it will defeat us. Our mind is what makes us who we are. My dear friends, with that in mind, I will say, first of all, the mind can convince you. Your mind can convince you of things that aren't necessarily true. Can I say this? Your mind can convince you that you're sick. 
If you think long enough and hard enough that, you know, I don't feel well. Man, I got a stomach ache. Oh, I'm sure I'm running a fever. Oh, somebody did have a sniffle at church. I'm sure I got COVID. And if you think about that long enough, before long, you're going to convince yourself you got cancer. Can I say the reverse of that? There have been people that have been diagnosed with cancer, but have a good outlook, have a positive outlook, have the mindset, I'm going to beat this thing, and they do. There are other people that get the diagnosis, and they just curl up and die. How many of you heard that get the diagnosis, and within three weeks, they're having the funeral? What's the difference? The power of the mind. You say, can your mind heal you? No. It can't heal you, but it can set you up to where your body will heal. But let me see. Your mind will convince you that you're sick. I read one a, a statistic where they estimate 50 to 70% of the people who go to the doctor all have issues that really deal from the mind. Very, very seldom is it that they really have something that needs to be treated by the doctor. They've just convinced themselves they need to go to the doctor. 50 to 70 percent go to the doctor because they have convinced themselves they need to go to the, to the doctor. Me? You've got to drag me kicking and screaming to go. Even when I know I've got to go. But 50 to 70 percent can be traced to mental or psychological reasons why they're there. Mm, there's power in your mind. It can convince you you're sick. Can I say this? And this one I just threw in. It can convince you you're stylish. Have you ever walked around the mall somewhere and say, what were they thinking? <laughs> they think they look great. Yeah, I said years ago, I'm convinced people quit buying mirrors for their house. Yeah? Uh, listen, I'm not trying to be cruel, but something this big don't need to fit into something this big. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and really, I don't need to see it. Huh? But they think they look great. Have you ever seen these people think, what were you thinking? And you, get, you, you listen to them. I've seen them on TV. You listen to them. Boy, they think they're it. I'm thinking, dude, wake up. But their minds convinced them they're, they're stylish. Let me help you. It is not stylish. Even though COVID brought it back, it is not stylish to have a mullet. You're welcome. Ain't stylish. Huh? That ain't. Huh? You're welcome. It ain't. But they convince you, oh, I'm, I'm hip, I'm stylish. No, you're not. You look stupid. So, well, nobody told me that. I am right now. Well, I look good. Your mind's lying to you. No, you don't. Hmm? But our minds convince us. Yeah? Teenagers lose their minds. You ever think of that? They come out wearing stuff, and you're thinking, where's the rest of it? Or, you paid money for it? You paid money for blue jeans that are already wore out? That is not stylish. That is stupidity. Uh, can I say, when I was a kid and you got holes in the knees, they put an ugly patch over them that kept you from wearing the knees out of the next pair because you didn't want to look like a hobo. Now you walk around looking like a bum thinking you're stylish. You're not. You all know I'm telling you the truth whether you say amen or not. Uh, if you got hand-me-downs that had holes in the knees, you had cut-off jeans after that. It's crazy. Huh? Can I say this? The mind can convince you you're superior, that you're better than somebody. I got news for you. We's all made from dirt, and we're all going back to the dirt. You're not better than anybody. 
Oh, you may have more of life's conveniences. That does not make you better. Huh? Fellas, we all put our pants on the same way, one leg at a time. You're not better than anybody. Hmm? Just because you may have more money don't make you better. Hmm? Some of the greatest people that ever lived didn't have much. Hmm? Jesus himself didn't have a pillow to put his head upon. Hmm? Having things does not make you superior. Hmm? Huh? Having greater intellect doesn't make you superior. Having a better job doesn't make you superior. Hmm? Eating at different restaurants doesn't make you superior. In the end, White Castle's Longhorn, it all goes to the same place and all comes out the same way. It's true. Doesn't make you superior. Just preferences on taste. But your mind will convince you you're superior. You're better than somebody. You're not. And I don't care how good and how great you think you are, there's always somebody better. Hmm. Can I say this? The mind has convinced many that they're saved when they're not. Hmm. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The former things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Hmm. You know how no, you know somebody's saved? If they're saved, they live like they're saved. If they're saved... Uh, they desire the things of God. They desire the Scriptures. They desire the house of God. They desire being around the things of God. You don't have to get them kicking and screaming to the house of God. You don't have to pump and prime them to get to the house of God. They can't wait to get to the house of God. If they're saved, they love the, the Lord Jesus. Uh, they want to tell others what happened to them. Uh, uh, but folks that are constantly hiding in the shadows telling everybody they're saved, they didn't get the same thing that I got. When the Spirit of God moves inside of you, He changes you. Hmm? Hmm? You can't go back to a place where you repented and God changed your life. You're not saved. You can convince yourself all day long you are. But if you have to convince yourself, chances are you're not. Hmm? I don't have to convince myself. He convinced me when He changed me. Hmm? I mean, if everybody has to wonder about you, probably something wrong. Hmm? When it's evident, they don't wonder. Hmm? Uh, I remember back in the 70s, the first time I saw that bumper sticker, if you were tried for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to, you know, convict you? Hmm? But in my mind, I'm convinced. Well, it doesn't matter. What's, what's the evidence say? Hmm? Huh? Can I say this? Your mind can convince you you're secure. Do you realize you're only one breath away from losing everything? Hmm? Hmm? You may think you got, you got the world by the tail. But all, all you have to do is have a stroke. Or have a heart attack. Have a car crash. Hmm? Change your life. You're not as secure as you think you are. You should have been here for prayer. There were four old guys. I won't mention them. Randy, Brian, Clint. Who was the fourth one? I missed the fourth one. Phil. That's all over here on this side. We got done praying. I, 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 it was like the geriatric club. They was trying to, trying to get up off the altar and everything. I'm thinking, yeah. You, you may be on both feet thinking you're something tonight. i got news for you. Age creeps up on you real quick. Hmm? Uh, there's a lot of people think they're okay. Everything's great. Job thought the same thing. The Bible says, and there came a day. His whole life changed. You see, your mind can convince you of those things. But you know, your mind can convince you of other things. Your mind can convince you that you're ruined. I had to slow down to make sure I say this as close as I can say that word. It's one of them words I can't say. That your life is ruined. It's, that you're damaged. That you're useless. 
that you are of no account, no good. Your mind can convince you of that. There's a lot of people that have no self-esteem because their mind has convinced them that they are a lesser person, that they are damaged goods. Hmm? There's a problem with somebody always sees themselves in a negative light. They're always telling somebody, I'm not smart, I'm not pretty, I'm not good, I'm not this, I'm not that. That's, that's sure tale signs there's a problem. So your mind can convince you of those things. Remember our text. Hmm? What does it say? It says, uh, 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 for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You tell yourself long enough that you're damaged, guess what you are? You're damaged. And there are people that really believe they're damaged. That is the beauty about the grace of God. God specializes in fixing damaged goods. Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You're talking about a guy who was a murderer, a guy who was a religious persecutor, a guy who was an elitist who thought he was better than everybody else, but when he got born again, uh, he realized what he was was wrong, uh, but the grace of God healed his thinking, healed his heart, uh, healed his past, uh, secured his future, uh, and he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Amen. He wasn't damaged goods anymore. Hmm. Can I say this? Your mind can also convince you that you're right and everybody else is wrong. Hmm. I'm right and everybody else is wrong. We got a whole society that lives like that. Your mind can also convince you that you're the reason for everybody else's problems. You're the one at fault. My makeup makes it very hard for me to fathom this. How somebody can be in an abusive relationship and not leave. I'm going to pick on Miss Christina because this would never happen because Tommy raised a hand to her. She'd, she'd jack his world. I'm telling you that right now. Uh, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be getting about four guys to go get him on a, on a, on a cot and take him to Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but I can't fathom. Somebody tell you how terrible you are in mental abuse and physically abuse you and abuse you and abuse you and you stay in that, in that relationship. I can't fathom that. Leave. You don't have to put up with it. I've had to tell Christian people that. You don't have to put up with it. You can leave that joker. Hmm? Now, this is on live stream. I've got to be careful how I say this, but I'm going to say it. hundred years ago in the church, if a man laid a hand to a woman, Men in the church would go and they'd take care of the problem. Hmm? Can't do that now. Deputy Foster would be coming and seeing us. But that's how they used to handle it. But now you have people that are in abusive relationships and they stay and they convince themselves they're the reason that he beats on her. They have been told so long that they are no good and that this is what they deserve, and it's their fault. They convince themselves of that. How many times do they get out of it only to go back to it, and then something fatal happens? It's a terrible, terrible thing. I'm talking about the power of the mind tonight. It will convince you. Can I say this? Your mind will control you. One scientist said this, Early life stress negatively affects the mind. Abuse, neglect, and harsh or inconsistent discipline in early life increases the risk of depression and anxiety as well as obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. 
Your mind controls you to the point that it actually affects you physically. Now you hang with me tonight. I'm going somewhere to help you with these issues. Your mind will convince you. Your mind will control you. I read one statistic that said 30 to 70% of the time our minds are just wandering trying to find an escape. You wonder why we don't have re re revival? Because in every church service, 30 to 70% of the time you're here, your mind's somewhere else. That's why when the Bible says bring every thought under submission, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about fight, fighting your mind drifting because it is so easy to do because we are faced with so many things. I've seen somewhere where the brain has the capacity to have 50,000 thoughts per second. They say even while we sleep, our brain is constantly working. It's an amazing thing. Your mind can control you. Can I say this? There are religions built on you using your mind to control your destiny. Now, you can't control your destiny, but they teach you that. They teach you about coming into perspective and becoming one with the universe and be enlightened, bringing your mind to a subconscious level where you can arise and, and go above. You know why? Because they've learned the same things that we're talking about tonight. As a man thinketh, so is he. All Buddhism and, and Shintoism and all those Eastern religions all deal with your mind and getting your mind to elevate you above where you really are. Can I say this? Your mind will certify you or justify you. You know why a lot of people don't get right with God? They have in their mind justified the fact they don't need to get right with God. Judges says it this way in Judges 21, 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Is that not where we're living today? even in our churches. Proverbs 21, 2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. God knows what's in our heart. How many times have you heard me tell you the real battle is in our minds? It is. Can I say this? Not only will your mind certify you or justify you, your mind will also condemn you. Job 9.20 says this, If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Your mind will condemn you. Those things that you think and, and make yourself superior and all those things, those are very things that are going to condemn you before God. And then let me say this, your mind will corrupt you. You let your mind run down a path or a course that it wants to go, it will corrupt you. One scientist said this, Never underestimate the power of the mind to disempower. You get, let your mind go unchecked, it will disempower you. It will take away everything that God's tried to build up in your life. Your mind, left unchecked, will cause you to absolutely ruin your testimony. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says this, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. You better be careful what you think. There are people that think they know God's will for their life because they have aspirations of what they want and they're just waiting for God to sanction it. There are people who study their Bible to see how close they can live to the world and still get away with it. There are people who study their Bible just looking for a way to find something that will condone what they want. That's not God's will. 
God's will will absolutely eat your lunch until you do it. But most of the time, God's will is the direct opposite of what you really want. Can I say this? Miss Annette's right here. She'll tell you. The last thing that I really wanted to do was pastor when God called me to pastor. I was satisfied sitting on a church pew, coming to church. I mean, Marcy, you was there. We was faithful. We was there every time doors were open. We were faithful. We was happy as a lark. We paid our tithes. I went out on visitation. We did all those things. I was happy doing that. Thought I'd be doing that till one day the preacher died and then they say, hey, you want to church? I was happy doing what I was doing. I was not looking to leave my career to go to Owenton and put up with him. And I promise you, she wasn't wanting that. But God's will changed my desires. It amazes me how many people, you know, they have desires what they want to do for God, and then they look for ways for God to make it happen. It usually don't work that way. The preacher we had Sunday morning, Brother Brian, he was happy pastoring. He had no desire to go to Sri Lanka. God did that. That's how it works. But so many times, people get messed up because they think they're doing God's will. I, I'm thinking right now, people that have left our church tell me they're in the will of God, moving to other states and doing this and doing that, and every one of them's family is a mess today. Say, because they left our church? No, because they missed God's will. Let me summarize this thing. I'll give you a couple verses. I'll be done. I read this. It made so much sense. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this, and you'll find strength. Too many of you let outside influences dictate how you live and how you deal with stuff. I got news for you. It don't matter who wins the election, God's still on the throne. But there's some people, if it goes one way or the other, their whole world's going to be shattered. You know why? They're putting their faith in the wrong, wrong individuals. And they got their stock in the wrong government. Your stock ought to be in the one you're supposed to be laying treasures up in. Hmm? You have the power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you'll find strength. How? How can I find strength? How can I keep my mind from convincing me things that aren't true? And how can I keep my mind from controlling me? And how can I keep my mind from uh, uh, corrupting me and doing all these things? How? 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 Well, I'll give you two verses. You ought to run to these verses. You ought to think about these verses. You ought to live in these verses. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How can I renew my mind? Get in the Word of God every day and read it and study it and let God speak to you from His Word. It will change your mind. Quit thinking worldly ways and you'll start thinking spiritually, spiritual ways. And then Philippians 4, 8. I quote this verse to you every now and then. It's a powerful verse. It'll influence your life. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, you won't find politics in any of those things. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. When you learn to transform your mind and you choose to think on just things and virtuous things and righteous things and godly things, my dear friends, it will help you control your mind instead of your mind controlling you. You are then giving God the credence of your life and not yourself. Selfishness is the essence of sin. And left unchecked, your mind will become very, very powerful.
We started watching a show last night. I got bored, but I, I understood the concept of it. A new show called Next. I don't know if any of you watched it. It's basically the supercomputer that uh, kept reinventing itself and getting so smart that it started controlling other people's lives. And what it's really teaching is that Big Brother's out there, and Big Brother is really watching. You can't go anywhere Big Brother don't know. you got a cell phone in your pocket. He knows everywhere you go. Hmm? Big Brother knows. And every one of you that's got one of them Googles or Lexus in your home, Big Brother's taking note. Every one of you that's got Roku or, or cable, Big Brother knows what you're watching. Uh, every one of you that logs on and has got a camera in your computer, Big Brother's watching you. Now you, can, you can think I'm a conspiracy theorist all you want, but it's happening. They know. Now the reason you don't know that they know is because you're not really a threat, because who are you? Who am I? But they know. No man lives unto himself, no man dies unto himself, by the way. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that that computer, the premise beside it, behind it was is, is this superpower computer keeps reinventing itself and controlling. Well, that's really that computer you got in your head. It just keeps reinventing itself and looking for ways to gratify your flesh. And if you leave it unchecked, it will absolutely control you and ruin your life. Now, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. When you're in the Bible, you see what you are, and you see what you deserve. But you see what grace did for you, and you see what redemption does for you, and you see what justification does for you, and you see that you are to esteem others better than yourself. You're not a superior thinking. You see that we're fitly framed together. Uh, uh, you see that God's no respecter of persons. Uh, you see that even people that look uh, uh, much worse off than you and smell much worse off than you and have faced much worse things than you, they're still deserving of God's love. It changes your thinking. The problem with too much of us is we spend too much time entertaining things that gives power to our mind instead of entertaining what takes to control our mind. God help us be aware that our minds are powerful. But Jesus is all powerful. And learn to submit our will, our lives, and even our minds to the things of God and in so doing God then will truly be able to use us to impact somebody else's life the reason we don't impact other people is because we truly are just living like other people when we start living the way God wants us to live we will be so far ahead of where everybody else is they'll desire what we have it all starts with our thinking you get your thinking right and God will take care of all the rest God help us to realize the power of the mind and if we'll use that power for God's glory we'll impact our world and that's what it's all about alright I'm done brother Clint come get a song of invitation maybe you need to come and thank the Lord for his goodness <coughs> maybe you need to come and ask God to help you in some areas of your life Maybe you need to come tonight because he revealed something to you and you need to get it taken care of. I don't know. Maybe you just want to come and tell him you love him. I don't know. But he's getting a song ready and we're going to pray. and You just do business with God. Father, we love you. Lord, help us to realize our shortcomings. And most of the time, that's not living a wicked life. Most of the time, that's letting our mind and ourself having more control than letting you have control. Help us, Lord, to ponder these things tonight. And help us to train our minds to think on things above. Now, Father, bless. Certainly help your people. Lord, the devil has pulled out every stop. We're inundated with so many things today that distract our minds from you and your word. So God, help us. We need your touch. We need your help. 
And Father, we'll thank you for what you do, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.